Mr. Diana Marie, welcome to the Calling Caffeinated Podcast. Nice to be here. Thank you for asking me to join you. Absolutely. Cheers. I have my Hail Mary full of grace, punch the devil in the face mug. It's a little sass today. I have today. my uh, God, with God, even mornings are possible mug. <gasps> found that in the closet the other day and I thought, yeah, yep, that's for me. <laughs> yeah, we're right. both, it's Tuesday, so we're both doing like our motivational mugs. <laughs> <laughs> you got this. You can do it. You can do it. You can get up before five again tomorrow. <laughs> Is that what time you wake up in the mornings? That's what time I try to wake up. Wow. So I am not naturally a morning person, but uh, wow. that's part of the vocation. So it's a... Uh, it's good. I like being up in the morning. I just don't like getting up. Although I'm not sure that's related to the morning. I think mm-hmm. that's pretty much any time I just okay. have to get out of bed. It's I'm like, no, I could I could stay. But <laughs> <laughs> not usually a good idea. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so do you actually have, do you start praying before 5 a.m.? Or is it just you that that's, uh, you get up early, but then you're trying to get up even earlier. So, um, we have our mass at six 30 okay. in the mornings, uh, except on Sunday where we have it at ten fifteen, So the patients mm-hmm. can come with us. Mm-hmm. Um, but most of us get up a little earlier just to sort of, you know, some of us read, some of us do our meditation. Mm-hmm. Um, some of us just drink coffee and try to open our eyes. Um, mm-hmm. But we, um, so once we're in vows, we go over to our patients before mass and check on them and make sure that they're okay and that they're, you know, clean and comfortable. Um, Mm. So we check them before mass and then we go to mass and then after mass we go and serve them breakfast. So that's part of it also is just making sure that you're there for, for whoever you're caring for at that time in the morning. So. Wow. See, wow. that is amazing. That's such a striking um, resemblance to me with my vocation where my little sweet girl is up usually at like five, it, well, throughout the night, but then usually yeah. five thirty in the morning, she's like ready to go. That's and, right. uh, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. How, how many patients do you take care of every day? So we each have our own patients that are with us from the time they're admitted until the time that they die. And so it's been a little bit different with COVID because we had to go through a time where we uh, we had to quarantine everyone. We had to have a section that was for quarantine. So mm-hmm. there was a little bit more shifting where one, one sister would take care of them while they were in quarantine and then they would come over. But typically what we like to do, what we have done before that and are trying to get back to is, as health regulations allow, is that you get your patient and from the time that they arrive until the time that they die, they're, your, they're yours. So we have between two, sometimes up to four, but usually two or three um, people that we care for each. So that's um, amazing. Wow. It's wonderful. Yeah. And we, it depends on what each of them needs you know, how many people you care for. So we're really um, blessed in that way because we don't depend on government funding and we don't accept any money from the the patients themselves. So we're not dependent on um, making sure all of our beds are filled so that we can make the money we need to keep functioning and to pay all of our expenses. Um, The Lord really takes care of us um, through our benefactors and through uh, just different people being so generous. Um, So we have a lot of freedom to say, you know, like, okay, this person needs a lot more care. So Mm. you're going to have two patients right now. And then if you have patients who need a little bit less intensive care, um, then you can have, you know, three or four. So we have, we have some room to really put them first, which is the whole, the whole idea. So. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. I've, I've talked to a lot of nursing home workers and a lot of them find it difficult to um, be switching around uh, with their residents so much. And so mm-hmm. it must be, do you think it's very rewarding to have the same people that you build relationships with? Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So um, I know we'll probably talk about this a little bit later on, but that's our only apostolate. So we run two homes, one here in New York and one in Atlanta. And the only thing we do is take care of people who have incurable cancer and can't afford their care, their end of life care. So we 
are purely palliative care. Um, and it makes all the difference for people to get to know their caretaker and also for you to know them. It's, it's a lot like, um, you know, you were, I remember you wrote once when you were speaking about your daughter that um, the doctor told you no one's going to know her better than you, right? You're going to know her moods. You're going to know when she's uncomfortable. You're going to know when mm -hmm. she's happy, even if nobody else does. Um, and that's very much the same when you have people you're caring for that are sick, especially if you don't speak the same language or they're not able to speak at all. Um, the more time you spend with them, the more you're able to say, okay, that facial expression means that she's happy. This facial expression means that she's uncomfortable. This facial expression means she's not happy. I woke her up again. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then I had, <laughs> recently I had two women I was caring for and they're in a ward. So they, they shared a room and um, one spoke almost exclusively Spanish and one spoke almost exclusively Chinese. And I don't speak either of those languages. <laughs> wow. So, but we, we were able to make it work. First of all, they were both just very sweet and they really looked out for each other as much as they could too, which was so, so beautiful to see. Um, but also the more I was around them, the more I knew what she meant when she said this. <laughs> yes. Right. And yes. what these, this word meant, right. So like cookie, from my lady who spoke almost exclusively Chinese, cookie always meant Ritz cracker. It didn't mean cookie. <laughs> so, yep. um, yeah. you know, and ha always meant hot, but not in reference to water, only to her own temperature. <laughs> mm. And balala was banana. So, you know, and that mm. just became normal to the point that I would mm. go into the kitchen and be like, I need a balala. I'm like a banana. I don't. <laughs> 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 but the more you're with someone, the more it's just, part of your every day, you know? So. Yes. Wow. And I don't mean to compare your experience to these people being toddlers, but I will say with my toddlers, <laughs> they have their own language I have to learn as well. And so what, a, <laughs> what another interesting parallel. Wow. Yeah. Um, well, I can tell this is going to be an amazing conversation um, about your charism and your ministry, because what a special and beautiful beautiful thing, a beautiful way to spend your life. But let's back up a little bit to mm -hmm. uh, your conversion story in, I believe, grad school, right? And this was before uh, I knew yes. you. Yes. Right. T tell us yes. about that. Tell us how you learned okay. about the Dominicans <laughs> and your slightly abnormal uh, RCIA process. Abnormal is the wrong word. Extra special. I think it might extra. It. That sounds yes. so much nicer. Yeah. It does. It um. does. <laughs> Uh, your <laughs> abnormal RCIA. <laughs> I was okay with that, but extra special is really it's way better. <laughs> really pretty. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so, well, I grew up Mormon. I grew up in Utah in a small town called American Fork. Uh, I think it's on maps now, but when I was growing up, it was not. Um, but then in high school, my family moved to California. So I, I'd grown up in the Mormon church, but I really, um, it was just what our family did, you know, so that was pretty, pretty much, it was just everybody was Mormon, except for, I think, three people at my school. Um, and so then we moved to California, and obviously it's not like that. Um, so I didn't really see the difference between Mormonism and anything else. So I went to Presbyterian church, and then in college I went to a non-denominational non church, and I did go to one Catholic mass in college, but that was only for a research paper. Um, <laughs> I was taking a psychology or religion class, so I was like in the back, in the back taking notes. I'm like, what are so these people funny. doing? It's so weird. Um, <laughs> so then I wrote a paper about it, which I really wish I could find, because I would love to read it now. But that'd be fascinating. Um, but mostly I just wasn't anything, right? It was like spiritual, but not religious and mm -hmm. kind of all of the secular taglines. I, those were all mine. I was like perfectly comfortable with those. So I moved to Washington DC for graduate school and um, finished graduate school and had become more involved in yoga and things like that. So that was kind of my replacement for religion. I didn't never really got too far into the spirituality of it. Um, 
it was just sort of like, oh, we're all okay and you're okay and we're all part of each other and be nice. You know, that was like, okay, and it's good exercise. So there you go. <laughs> it's a ritual <laughs> usually for most people. Right. So, yeah. and it's, there was a really good organic food place next door. You know, my motives were not terribly deep for <laughs> Um, but I, I think I was always, I never, I, it's, I never didn't believe in God. Um, it's kind of funny because I think the two things that kept me from ever becoming an atheist were sunsets and biology because they're just mm. so spectacular that I couldn't believe it was an accident. Mm. It just made so little sense to me that it would be. And sunsets are so unnecessary, you know? Like the mm -hmm. sun could just go down. It doesn't need to be beautiful, but mm -hmm. it is every day. Um, I still love sunsets, obviously. <laughs> um, I agree. I'm with you. So, um, so then I, I actually started seeing someone who was nominally Catholic and I started looking into the Catholic Church partly because of that, um, with his assurance that to be Catholic, you didn't need to believe everything the church taught. So I was like, oh, okay, great. Oh. <laughs> I can be that kind of Catholic. Um, so, <laughs> like I said, not terribly high motives at this point in my life. It's um, amazing that you're here now. I just it's like, I actually did not know this about you because you and I haven't spoken in like 11 years, probably 10, yeah. 10 years, maybe. Um, right. well, I, guess, I think well, I guess 2015 briefly, or 2014 was when right. I saw you Bri yeah. very briefly. So briefly, and I was in like postulant haze, so I don't know <laughs> if I even made sense when I was talking that year. So <laughs> gets better. Um, <laughs> I was I was in discernment haze, so I didn't. I was in vocational discernment haze, which I'm pretty sure is worse. So the fact that we actually recognize each other is pretty amazing. It's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah, I think you recognized <laughs> me because I think you were wearing like a little. Um, yes, like a veil, the like veil a, and the a jumper. miniature veil and a jumper. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you picked mm -hmm. me out and I was like, what? And we were, <laughs> oh my gosh. So I, I was visiting the little sisters of the poor and mm -hmm. you were already a postulant. And so yes. it was this weird, like, oh my gosh, is this real life? Right. Because we only yeah. knew each other in Washington, <laughs> DC. And then there we are, both are in New York. It was yeah. hilarious. And we only saw each other for like a second, took, took a hug, took a picture, it was, and, and talked a little bit, but it was so cool. It was so cool running into you, but I haven't yeah. seen you since then. So, right. yeah, yes. so I, this is uh. fascinating. So you see, you're dating a nominally Catholic man yeah. who, who thinks you don't have to believe everything. Right. Yes. That was part of that's the deal. That's a rumor. So that's a rumor. That's, that's, that's not true. Um. <laughs> Let's put that to rest right now. That's right. Well, just in case anybody was wondering throughout the episode. Um. <laughs> So we, we continued to, to date and I was just sort of, I was sort of interested in the, like the church and, but he really couldn't answer any of my questions. Um, I went to mass with him a few times. Um, and probably the biggest thing in retrospect that sort of prepared me to, to really get to know the church was I, he was stationed in Naples. He was in the Navy. And so when you're dating somebody who lives in Italy, you go visit them <laughs> in Italy. I mean, I think you would do that even if you don't like them that much. It's like, oh yeah, Italy, <laughs> of course I'm going to go visit you. Sure. So um, it was actually over Easter in 2009. Um, and I went to Easter mass in Siena, not having any idea who St. Catherine of Siena was. Um, hmm. Went to all these just beautiful churches and um very holy places that I recognize now as um, just extremely, not just beautiful and full of culture and life, but um, full of this history of the saints and of the mm -hmm. church. Mm -hmm. um, and we went to the Basilica, uh, St. Peter's in Rome, and he dropped me off because he needed to go find a parking space and he'd lived there for several years. So he's like, I've seen St. Peter's about 15 times. So um, he dropped me off. And the first place I went was the Pieta because I love that sculpture. I remembered I had actually mm -hmm. been to Rome with my Presbyterian youth group in high school, uh, which was a very interesting <laughs> experience. Mm -hmm. Their take on St. Peter's is a little bit different than ours. <laughs> we'll have a whole conversation about that sometime. I'm very yeah. curious. <laughs> 
Um, and I just remember looking at the statue and being like, stone shouldn't look like that. Like, this is beautiful. Mm. Stone shouldn't look like fabric and it shouldn't look like flesh. And it, sh- but it does. It's, it's just it's like you're waiting for them to move. Mm. Um, so I went right back to it just for the artistic value. Um, and as soon as I got there, I just burst into tears. Mm. I feel bad for whoever was standing near me. Um, and I just, I couldn't help it. I mm. don't, I didn't know why I was crying. I tried to find reasons like, oh, I'm sad. I'm leaving tomorrow. I'm mm. tired. I'm, you know, and like none of them fit. Mm. So, um, the my my boyfriend at the time comes in and he has this look on his face like I left you like how long did it take me to find a parking spot like I wasn't gone that long why are you crying you know um so we walked around and I kind of calmed down and he kept asking me like why why are you so moved by this that there's a lot of beautiful art in St. Peter's I mean there's no shortage of just gorgeous sculpture gorgeous painting gorgeous architecture but why this um and I said to him, I don't know what this means, but that's what love looks like. That's like somebody took love and they, they carved it into stone. And I don't, mm-hmm. I don't know. And it wasn't our Lord that captivated me. I actually kind of ignored him. It was Our Lady's face. Mm-hmm. Um, she caught my attention. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, we kind of went on about our business and I pretty much forgot about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you know, went back to normal life in Washington, D.C., and he was transferred back to the U.S. uh, that summer, and I just started to become more and more curious about the church, about what what he believed and why he believed it, and, you know, he said he believed this, but why didn't he want to talk about it, and why couldn't he answer my questions, and I started to have a lot of questions, so I emailed, um, I went to St. Peter's on Capitol Hill, website because I'd been to church with him there once. The other St. Peter's. Yes, the other St. Peter's, uh, which I love because uh, it's beautiful and also it has the, and the gates of hell will not prevail against, against it has the inscription that's in St. Peter's, it has it in St. Peter's and Capitol Hill too, so I thought, oh, okay, good. Um, (laughs) So I emailed the, I didn't email the person in charge of our CIA because I didn't want to become Catholic. I just wanted a book on Catholic stuff. Um, I was very pretty sure that I wasn't going to become Catholic unless I actually like got engaged or something like that. We definitely were not there. So I was like, I just need a book. I need a reliable source of information. Um, so I emailed the person who was in charge of... Um, in charge of adult Sunday school, which is a program they had just started um, for people whose children were in Sunday school, but also wanted to learn about their faith and also for anybody else who has just wanted more catechesis, right? People who had never been able to learn about their faith. So Mm -hmm. I emailed that person who ended up being a Dominican prior and tried to be as polite as I could while letting him know that I didn't really want to become Catholic, but I'd really like a book. I want to take a quick break from our wonderful guest here to just invite you to join the True North Discernment course. If you've been following my content for a while, you know I love talking about discernment. And this course basically teaches you how to do everything that we've talked about in the podcast over the last three and a half years. It's five modules and self-paced. You'll get videos from me as well as worksheets and personalized coaching guidance so that you're not just thrown in the deep end. The course is based on the rich tradition and history of our church. Uh, It's the saints, especially St. Ignatius of Loyola, as well as some of the wisest minds in the world today. So I am so proud of this course. I taught it in 2020 and it's been a year and a half and now I'm opening it up again for a limited time only. So I I invite you to grab your spot today. You can go to stacysummerow.com slash shop and check it out. I just wanna pass this on to the world because We're always making decisions. You never know the answer to every one of your questions until you die, until you take your last breath. So this is applicable really for everyone. And I think it's such a fascinating question, finding that intersection of what you want and what God wants for you. And I think the best way to do that is to actually take it into your own life and to think deeply about these things. 
This is the Personhood 101 course that I wish that I had had years ago, but it didn't exist, so I wrote it. So check out True North uh, using the link below. Also, we have a wonderful sponsor today, which is Catholic Match. I've spoken to a lot of single young adults, and I know there's so much anxiety surrounding uh, dating in general, and especially online dating. Now, Catholic Match and I do not want you to feel like you have no support, and so Catholic Match has a lot of advice on their Instagram account, which is at Catholic Match, as well as their blog. So you can avail yourself of all of this great advice so that you can be in control in the driver's seat of your online dating experience. Now, of course, you can't control other people and what they do, but you can control your own reactions to things and help to create a dating culture where everyone feels valued. Here's a good example. When I was on Catholic Match, waiting to meet my husband, which I eventually did, hooray! Um, I received a message from a man that I'd been messaging back and forth with, and he said, you know, I think you're really great, but I am going to move forward with somebody else that I've been talking to for a while. Um, thank you so much, and God bless you. And I just thought that was a really great thing, that he didn't just leave me hanging, he actually reached out to let me know, this is our last conversation. And I didn't feel upset by that at all. I thought, hmm, that's a really decent guy. So you can make those kinds of choices for yourself as well, and and reading the Catholic Match blog, which is included with your membership when you sign up for free, is a great way to really help you move forward with confidence and clarity and peace throughout this crazy dating world that we're in. So do get started with a free profile before March 15th. And when you sign up using my unique link, which is catholicmatch.com slash called and caffeinated, you will be entered automatically into a drawing to win a free six month membership. So here's your sign from God. Go ahead and join Catholic Match with a free profile. And now let's get back to the episode. Um, and if you know anything about Dominican friars, asking them for a book is like the most dangerous thing you can do. So <laughs> I <laughs> just, I didn't even know where I was, what road I was going down when I did that. I thought it was a very simple request, but he uh, emailed me back and um, said, well, I can give you a book, but if you just have some preliminary questions, here are some other options for learning about church, or you can meet with me. And I thought, well, that sounds interesting. Um, and then I made sure he knew I was a girl because I knew that priests weren't allowed to be around women right that makes sense i don't know um <laughs> like, you know what it shows great like, respect for the religion even though you weren't i was trying you were trying you were doing a good job. like they're like a mormon missionary forever and mormon missionaries aren't really allowed to spend time around women so i just want to make sure we're real clear that's great on this. Um, oh. <laughs> so um and that's kind of was just how the ball started rolling so i I met with him and then he became uh, just a really wonderful part of my uh, my life and well actually he was the priest who celebrated my final vows so he's wow um, he just really um, took the time to teach me and answer my questions but also to get me involved in other things so he promised me that if I started RCIA I didn't have to become Catholic mm -hmm. so <laughs> which was a trick um, a dirty trick it was, yeah <laughs> not although even more of a trick was that he was like no it's fine we'll just answer your questions but but why don't you come to Compline with the brethren and I was like I don't feel like this is a good idea I felt like I should have a sign like I'm not Catholic I'm sorry and he's like just just come in the chapel like you don't even have to talk to anyone it's That's okay awesome. and this was the at the Dominican House of Studies that's right Yes. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which is yeah. an absolutely beautiful. When Nora was in the NICU, I mm -hmm. walked past it every day. It was a yeah. two mile walk from the Ronald McDonald house over to Children's National. And I would walk past the Dominican House of Studies. And I mean, I, I went to Catholic U, so I was right there mm -hmm. across the street, but I never really looked at it for like the whole time I was at CUA. <laughs> My mind was in a very different place. And it is beautiful, On the, at it least is. externally. I've never been inside, yeah. but beautiful yeah, and vibrant there's a lot of young men who are joining the dominicans yes um, like the doing very well. father gregory pine who is just a delight i'll link um to my interview with him uh he's yes, so he's, great he is great yep <laughs> yeah he's he's just great and you knew him there right he said he yes he was a student brother when i first started going to the, to the house of studies so yeah they um they uh, have been very good to me the brothers so that's awesome a lot of prayers <laughs> So you started, 
Yeah. So you started RCIA with the promise you didn't have to become Catholic. Um, yes. And obviously you, you went through with it. <laughs> I started in September of that year. And the more I learned, the more it was just sort of, I didn't think I could do it. I didn't know if I could make all the changes that I felt needed to be made in order to be Catholic. Um, but I couldn't deny that it was true. The Lord brought me to a very thriving um, diverse parish with people of all different ages and backgrounds who all loved their faith um, and it was wonderful you know I was able to see um, lay people who who were single who loved their faith and were living it and lay people who were married and had wonderful families and mm -hmm. then the friars were just like thriving religious community who we're doing all the things the world tells you are not going to make you happy, right? Like they're living in community. They're, um, they don't own anything. They don't make their own decisions. These are very intelligent, capable people who have to ask yeah. whether they can borrow a car and they're not married. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, you meet more religious, but primarily the, the friars initially where it's just like, and they were the happiest people I knew. Hmm. And they were all themselves, you know, yes. and they all kept assuring me in different ways and that the Lord loved me and that he wasn't waiting for me to change hmm. to become lovable. And I think it was also um, like the witness of them joyfully living their vocation. It was the first time I'd really been around men where there was no question mark, like, well, what do you mean by that? And like, what are your intentions here and what are my intentions and like the boundaries of their joyfully lived celibate life were so freeing mm -hmm. um it was just wonderful to be welcomed in a way where there was no question about mm -hmm. what what the intentions were it was just like they were just happy that we were searching um yeah. it just seemed so disinterested um yes. and that was very unique <laughs> Yes. You know, it was, it was really beautiful to have that, um, that disinterested care on the part of, of people who are teaching you um, and living their own vocation. Yeah. So, yeah, so it sort of snowballed as, yeah, it just, it just couldn't fight it anymore. And then you, you start doing things, right? So you're volunteering at your parish and you're um, going to Eucharistic adoration as often as you can. And you're praying the liturgy of the hours, you're praying the rosary, and then people keep asking why you're not Catholic and you start to run out of answers. You're like, I just really like this stuff. I don't think you have to be Catholic to do it. So, <laughs> you know. It's my hobby. It's just like yeah, it's, Catholic it's, without it's, being Catholic. It's just. <laughs> exactly. Stop questioning yeah. my hobby. It's, it's just, this is totally normal. I'm fine. <laughs> I don't see why you keep saying I have to be baptized to do this, you know. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> so, okay, true or false, you have to be Catholic for two years in order to be accepted into a religious order. Yes. True. Yep. Okay. That is, I heard that lots that of is, places. I didn't know if that was hard and fast or if that was just like some charismatic Yeah, so there's orders. canon law that has a certain limit. It's okay. two years. And then communities can vary that. So certain communities okay. say, okay, if you just came to the church, we'd like you to wait three years or four years. Um, so that, that is variable, but it's at least two years, um, which is, uh, our church loves us so much. I mean, she's, the wisdom of the church is always going to um, just guide you properly. It's beautiful. Um, because in my RCI class, I think everyone except the engaged couple, um, I had a wonderful RCI class. I'm still friends with most of them. That's awesome. Um, everybody was like, well, yeah, religious life. I think, I think I'm going to be a nun or a priest or, um, you know, cause you're just so excited. You found this beautiful, true thing and there's a way to dedicate your life to it completely. And so, yeah, that's what I want to do. Um, I'm the only one, <laughs> everyone else is married. <laughs> right? So, yeah. Right. And, and that's that two year discernment period is just good to just, get used to going to mass on Sundays, like you said, right. and confession mm -hmm. and all of the Catholic things. And probably right. your friend group has to go through 
you know, your friends ha are, they're on a journey as well of accepting mm -hmm. or not accepting your faith and your family as well. And yeah, so much, so many changes. So when yeah. did you feel a pull toward religious life? So was it during RCIA where you were like, I think I want to be a nun? Um, well, <laughs> it's really hard to answer that question because it was, it was always an option because of the religious I had met. Mm -hmm. Um, in, you know, once I started RCA, but it was very much um, this thing that's like, okay, am I just idealizing it? Is it mm. just like, you want the biggest piece of cake? So since the church says this is objectively better, you have to want this. Um, and I didn't really, I just wasn't really sure. And I think I had really good guidance in that there was a lot of assurances that it wasn't like you didn't choose a vocation. First of all, you don't choose a vocation <laughs> necessarily. You say yes to it, but you can't, you can't and don't force it. Mm -hmm. um, but also that you're not doing it so that God will love you more, right? It's not like, yes. well, if I do this, God will love me the most. And if I do this, then he'll still kind of stick by me, but it'll be like, eh, all right, I'll give you like, you know, generic graces rather than name brands plus, or something plus. yeah right? like the lame the box is just like the black writing <laughs> yeah right a priest I know, calls them skim milk graces it's like he always wants to give you whole milk <laughs> Right. Yes. Right. And when you yeah. say, I, I do want to clarify as well, because I kind of used to debate with my husband on this. I, I hated when people would say that religious life was objectively better simply because it makes it sound like the rest of us who are supposed to be married are <laughs> like exactly like what you said, like the skim milk graces. But it's objectively better because you um, are already living out your heavenly mm -hmm. state. So you right. are with marriage. Marriage has to be dissolved by death. And then um, there will not be marriage in heaven. So you are essentially already living out your heavenly uh, life mm -hmm. while on earth, right? Like you're, you're consecrated mm -hmm. to the Lord. And yeah, does that, did, did I say that correctly? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, no, that's very much, it's, um, I think it's also the, the question of like the means are there. So there are, there are things that, you know, we all kind of help us grow in our unit union with the Lord and ideally part of the point of religious life is that those things are more readily available right so yes i have my apostolate but i also have a structure of prayer built into my day mm -hmm. that you probably don't have with three little ones nope <laughs> or they're probably not like oh now's now's mommy's holy hour time like we're gonna just leave her alone you know, whereas yeah, I no, have, no. <laughs> I have time in the chapel where my, where I can't go work, right? Mm -hmm. My sisters, we take turns covering the different hours of the day that need to be taken care of. Yes. But when you're not on the floor, you're not on the floor, right? And, and that's part of the beauty of community Absolutely. life also is that I never worry that my, my patients aren't going to be taken care of just as well as if I was there because we all love them. Right. And we all have this charism and we all want the best for them. So if there's a real freedom there, you know, yes. um, I don't have to go grocery shopping. I don't have to decide what I'm going to wear every day. And they're little things, but they're meant to free, to free us so that we can focus more on the Lord so that we're less Absolutely. distracted. So in that, in that way, it's, you know, the more, a more perfect state also because so many of the things that distract us are just taken away, right? Not that we can't still find distractions. I mean, we're, we're pretty good at that if you want to be, but um, ideally <laughs> you let the life work. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, it is. But yeah, no, it it's not about, it's not about like getting better graces or um, you're automatically going to be holier if you're religious, um, but that you have more means at your disposal mm. to grow in that union with the Lord um, and hopefully grow more quickly. But that's also, you know, that's up to the Lord as well. You have to cooperate with all those things. So, and, and it's in the end, it's about love, right? So yes. Yes. you're spending your days loving the Lord and the vocation he's called you to, then that's, what's going to make us all saints. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're being faithful. Yeah. And you're mm -hmm. able to do that with a more single-minded focus. Um, right. 
Yeah. So lovely. Um, and beautifully explained. Thank you. So once you were attracted to religious life, what were some mm -hmm. of the, um, how did your family react to that and your friends? Did you have supportive friends? And also what were some of the mm -hmm. things that were the most difficult to imagine giving up as part of religious life? Those are really good questions. <laughs> let's, see. <laughs> let's see what we can do. Um, it wasn't so, that long ago. It was what, six was, years ago? Seven years uh, ago? Uh, eight years ago eight in years October. Ago. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. our formation is one year proficiency, two years novitiate, five years of temperate vows. Mm -hmm. And I just professed final vows in September. So, yay. um, yay. <laughs> Still very excited about that. Um, so I started looking into it very tentatively. Um, I just felt like it wasn't, I was worried I was going to force it. Like I was worried that because I liked the religious I was around, I should want to do that. And marriage seemed kind of hard because <laughs> you had to like pay bills and do all this stuff. And I just was like, well, I don't know if I can really concentrate because I get distracted really easily. And I think one of the more serious ones is like, I couldn't quite figure out how I would love a husband as well as I felt a husband should be loved. Mm. and love the Lord as much as I already loved him. Mm -hmm. um, so I was always in kind of like a dilemma about that because I would, I, you know, I went on dates here and there and I, I felt like I was seeing somebody in addition to somebody I was already seeing. <laughs> it was sort of a weird, a weird feeling. It's probably a good indication you should look in a religious life. Um, and my friend who's now like you're cheating on your boyfriend <laughs> yeah it did feel that date. way a little bit where i was like so you want to go to holy hour right it's like that may not be a date <laughs> like, <laughs> like you should probably want to talk to the person you're on a date with that's hilarious um my friend yeah my friend that's a priest now he and i were joking about this because he entered seminary the month before i entered uh the convent and he and I were like, yeah, you know, <laughs> I guess one of the indications that you probably should look seriously into religious life for the priesthood is that whenever you go on a date, you end up talking about religious life for the priesthood. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you did that too? And he's like, all the time. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so funny. That's like talking about your ex-boyfriend or girlfriend all the time is like one of those red flags, like <laughs> not over it. You're not over it. Right. Yeah. Oh, this is something good. you need to look into. Yeah. 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 We've only made it to appetizers and you're already like, so where have you visited? Um, so, <laughs> uh, uh. so I think I was just very wary of, of like forcing it. Right. Once I really actually started discerning, I really didn't talk to most people about it um, because I needed to not have it be like a, a group think. <laughs> yes. So I needed you know, some people was like, well, you like to talk a lot. You should be a, a teaching sister. You, yeah. you know, you like to volunteer. You should be, uh, you should work with the poor. You like to pray. You should go to the cloister. Um, well, you like all those things, but you also like people. So you should get married. And it's just so many ideas and it's so much, uh, so many opinions. And I just had to input. kind of, yeah, I had to yeah. sort of take a step back from that when I started visiting places, um, kind of be open to the different things the Lord wants to do um, so one, one and just at a time. enjoy. Yeah. And enjoy what's around you at the time. And yeah. then once I started discerning, enjoy discerning. I know that it can seem so stressful to discern, but one thing I really um, tried to do was enjoy learning about the beauty and diversity of our church. Mm -hmm. Um, Cause it's not just about making like the right or wrong decision or, or saying like, this is, you know, I don't want to mess this up, but looking around and being like, Oh, I'm not, I know I'm not called to this. Right. So I never felt called to um, being uh, somebody who was in vows, but was a lay person, right. Like mm -hmm. a um, secular institute or anything like that. It never appealed to me, but I really admired the people that I saw doing it. And I just mm -hmm. thought this is such a beautiful part of the church yes. that I didn't know about. And then there are other orders that I, I knew about or had learned about, and I felt no pull to visit them. Um, but there was no doubt that their life was just beautiful and that they fed the life of the church. And I became very grateful for 
these different communities that I knew I would never be a part of, mm. but, but were part of the life of the church and somebody was called to them. Um, I love that. Yeah. I love that. I think approaching it with wonder and curiosity without so much pressure, like I have to know now or else, or else right. what? And that's totally yeah. a lie that you have to know now. In fact, if, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you had to make a decision that quickly, it just doesn't make sense in the whole picture of your life. It's right. sort of like saying you have to fall in love in one instant or else it's not real. Right. And, and that makes it yeah. a checklist instead yeah. of a relationship, you know? Absolutely. So I think that was a big part of, um, the advice I got to not uh, just jump right in is that you're still developing a relationship with the Lord, mm. like hearing how he speaks to you. And, and I'd been very blessed in that way when I was coming into the church. Um, he made the saints a huge part of my life mm. coming into the church right away, um, especially St. Mary Magdalene was just, um, she just looked out for me. You know, she, she was like, this is how you love the Lord. Let me teach you what this looks like. Wow. when you don't feel like you're worthy to do it and you don't feel like this is going to work and you don't know how you're going to do it for your whole life. Don't do it for your whole life today. Do it right now. Mm. <laughs> Just stay by him. And that's, and she, she really kind of took my hand and um, led me along, but wow. also wow. Eucharistic adoration was a big part of that. So learning to stop and be quiet and that was ultimately how I decided to come into the church. So I was at adoration, praying the rosary, telling the Lord all the reasons I couldn't be Catholic. And like in the front row, you know, I'm like, this is never going to work. I'm not Catholic at all. It's like, really? <laughs> Look around. Um, but I was, <laughs> yeah, great. So I was so praying great. the rosary and I was praying the baptism of the Lord and all of a sudden in my head, the only thing that kept repeating was get baptized. We'll figure everything else out later. Mm. Get baptized. We will figure everything else out later. And I was like, okay, I'm not hearing voices, but that's not me. And I don't know. <laughs> what's going so I ran to my RCA teacher and I was like, something weird happened. <laughs> and he sort of helped guide me along in that. Um, so it was things like that where I was still just learning how he, how he sounded when he spoke to me because it wasn't some big booming voice and it wasn't a vision or a, or a sound, but it, but he does speak, right? Mm -hmm. He says we can, we can know his voice mm. and follow him. And so um, learning to hear his voice is a really important part of discernment because if you don't know who you're listening to yes. or what he sounds like, you can't do it. And that's also once you enter. Yes. So yes. I've, met our community through the friars and um i had told my i hadn't told my parents i was discerning um they were really good about it i have to say uh, my dad was really disappointed because it meant i wouldn't have children mm. uh, my mom <laughs> my mom probably gave my favorite reaction which was well you raise your kids to make their own decisions and then they just go ahead and do it <laughs> <laughs> your mom sounds a lot like you very dry <laughs> That's humor. That's awesome. <laughs> so yeah, that was, and then I think my sister was, she was pretty quiet about it, but I think it was hard because she felt like she was losing me. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and we, and every, everything you're saying as well, I think applies to those of us who are cradle Catholics and those mm -hmm. of us who have Catholic parents. Cause like you said, learning to discern any decision, you have to learn the Lord's voice. And once you become interested in religious life, you don't want to just leap in with both feet and not continue to tend to your prayer life. So that totally mm -hmm. speaks to me as well. And then I know with entering, even those who, whose parents have raised them Catholic, mm -hmm. a lot of parents who don't want their children to become priests or religious yeah. for that reason, they feel like they're losing them. So what, right. what, yeah, what advice do you have for those people in that position who are well, scared think, of disappointing their family? Yeah, there are a couple of things that I found extremely helpful. And um, one was just to be very compassionate to the people in your lives. Mm. Um, I think m most of us, even when we're just entering, we realize that we don't really even know what we're doing. And that's why it can be so stressful to have people be like, well, what about this? And what about this? And you're like, I don't know. Mm. I can't remember my name. I'm so tired. Um, <laughs> and so you get, it's easy to get really stressed out and kind of forget that these people just care about you. 
Yeah. And they're, they're afraid of losing you or they're struggling with their own faith. If they're not, you know, they're not where they, uh, they want to be or they're not where you are. Um, but that's okay. That's where they are. And you're doing something you don't fully understand too. And so it's easier. Um, I think when we remember that it's easier to say, like, I don't have the answers to these questions, but I promise you'll be a part of this. Um, you have to think of the offertory at the Mass, right? So at the offertory, we take the gifts that we've been given and we bring them up to the altar mm. to give them to the Lord. And from that, he gives us himself. And that's, I mean, none of these things are things that he just wants to take away because he doesn't love us, but because yes. he wants to give them to us in a fuller, uh, more selfless way. Um and that's, it's also about purifying those relationships, right? So it's not what I'm going to do for my family. It's, I have to give this to the Lord and let him make this relationship even more beautiful yes. than it was. Um, and he will. I mean, I can't believe the number of different ways that he has satisfied desires that I didn't even fully admit to him. Because I just said, well, I have to make that a sacrifice. So I tried not to think about it. And She's like, no, no, I take your heart seriously, mm-hmm. and I love you. And part of uh, the challenge and the beauty of religious life for me has been um, the fact that part of it is just giving the Lord that time to do those things in you. Um, because I wanted it all done right away, and I was like, this isn't working. And I mean, I had a lot of these inhibition questions <laughs> where I was like, that's it. I'm going to go be a CNA somewhere else. I'm going to be a third order Dominican. Like I'm going on with my plans. This is not working. <laughs> Usually I just needed like more sleep, but um, they're just <laughs> days. Sleep does you help a lot of things. It does help a lot of things. Yes. Um, <laughs> but then I would look at the people that I admired most, which were the saints or, you know, and I would look at them and, and the question is always like, but what if you didn't leave? What if you gave him the time to answer these questions in his time, in his way? I mean, what if you stayed? And I was always free to leave. I mean, I don't like lock the doors and seal them, you know, Mm -hmm. but I just, I could never, I became fascinated with what God could do if I stayed. Mm. Um, And then I always think of also the book of Esther and the one part where Mordecai is telling her to go to the king because the Jewish people are in trouble. And I won't quote it right because I can't, <laughs> not very good at that. But he says, it may be for this that you were called to this place. Mm-hmm. And I think that's so true of religious life, right? I, you know, when our families have trouble, you can't always just rush in and, and help them. But that doesn't mean that taking their needs to the king isn't what you're supposed to be doing and is somehow going to make the difference. Yes. in their life you know he's never gonna leave you um he's never gonna leave the people you, i mean what husband would do that right like yeah. when you got married john wasn't like well i'm gonna i'm gonna love you but your family like they're pretty much on their own <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yes yes so sure. the lord doesn't do that either and um yeah. it's yeah. there are there are reasons we're here that we're not going to know about right away and that's that's okay Um, But it's not purposeless. Yes. Yeah, there's a a beautiful um, prayer or just piece written by Pierre Taillard de Chardin. I hope I said his name correctly. I've heard, so I actually have, this is the only thing I've read of his. I don't know anything else about any of his works. I've heard some of them might be a little suspect, but I think you couldn't find anything theologically wrong with this particular passage. It's called Patient Trust it's about, um, it's like, let your, your ideas mature gradually, let them shape, let them grow without undue haste, um, mm-hmm. as if they could be, uh, like, you want to get to the end, as if you could be today, what time would make of you tomorrow. But it's basically mm-hmm. saying you can't. Um, and I said, in, in the meantime, just accept the anxiety of feeling yourself in suspense and incomplete. And that has spoken to me so beautifully because there is so much power in 
staying. Now, with that being said, of course, you know, this is a, a podcast where we're talking, we are talking about your life and your story, but also we're talking sort of mm-hmm. theoretically. And so someone right. listening to this isn't going to necessarily be able to take what you're saying and distinguish in their own life if it's time to go or time to stay or whatever. But I think you speak such beautiful wisdom, especially to those of us who want things. This is me who want things to move fast and we want to know now mm-hmm. and we're so afraid of wasting time. Right. And that was one yeah. of my biggest things with discernment was like, oh, discerning my vocation specifically, really and discerning anything. But especially with my vocation, it was like, well, if I don't know this year, then it's going to take me three years to meet a guy. And then we're going to have to date for two years and then be <laughs> engaged for two years. And then I'm not going to have any kids and, you know, have the opportunity to have children until I'm 40. And it's like, hold on. Wait. Right. <laughs> And I love all of those plans we make. They like totally yeah. exclude the other person or the yeah. community, right? Like they're just going to, they just, they have the same plan and there's not going to be any discussion or. Yeah, like, right. It's just, this is yeah. how it has to be. If I don't figure this out today, it's like, okay, no. And that, right. but that is a powerful tool that the devil will use against us. Yeah. If we let him, I love that. I love that you said, you know, what if I stayed, what if I just followed through till tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And obviously there was enough there that you loved your charism. You love your way of life, which actually might be a good turning point. Cause I, before we go, we don't have too much more time, but I did want to make sure I asked you about your charism, how you found your community and you know, you care for, um, hospice patients is palliative care and hospice care. It sounds like, and which Mm -hmm. is amazing. And wow, what a calling. Um, I feel like everybody I know who has cared for someone with cancer, Mm -hmm. my dad went through cancer and my mom, you know, had to care for him. And it was very intense, you know, it's just so intense. And I think, you know, she was, she and my dad were of course very relieved when he came through it on the other side and she no Mm -hmm. longer has to be the caregiver and he no longer has to be the patient. So, but to accept that as your life that once this person passes away, there's going to be another person that you're going to have to shepherd right. through those doors is like, that is mm-hmm. incredible to me. So tell me about how you found your community and became attracted to them. Um, so I, I heard about our community from one of the Dominican friars who did summer ministry mm-hmm. with us. So normally, uh, you know, when we're not in a pandemic, uh, we have student brothers who come up for the summer and they, they spend a few months with us or, you know, a month or a few months. And so I, I was speaking with one of them when I came back and I, I mean, I loved the Dominican charism. I loved the friars I knew were very much themselves. There was not like a cookie cutter mm. um, friar. Cause that's, I think something I was scared of with religious is like, I had to have like the nun voice and like, <laughs> like move really slowly and like talk you know you have all these ideas yeah, about yeah, yeah. what you have to be in order to be a sister um, I have to change every mannerism that I ever have right my sense like, I can humor, only I can't laugh right. no sarcasm like yeah. no joking around I'm not allowed to think despicable me is hilarious anymore um <laughs> I can only use the words delightful and lovely to describe things, <laughs> which I do a lot now, but not exclusively. <laughs> yeah, um, also I also your last thought that Andrews, so you you uh, have you're basically Julie Andrews, right? So you have to sing, yeah, while with the spinning, you sew yeah. and all that right. kind of thing. Yeah, okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was all That's really terrible. working well for me, um, <laughs> and also I got into my head at one point that. Um, sisters like religious generally part of like the penitential part of the life was taking cold showers and only eating sandwiches I don't know where that came from Hmm, okay I said that to my spiritual director and he usually could find something like good or beautiful and kind of gently lead me towards the truth but I said I was like I can't I can't look into religious life I hate sandwiches and I just really (laughs) like warm showers and he just looked at me like I don't even know how to (laughs) <laughs> one of the few times a Dominican has been speechless during spiritual direction. <laughs> so <laughs> you get all kinds of crazy ideas and you just have to take a deep breath most of the time. <laughs> but I found out that we had sis- Dominicans had sisters that mm-hmm. didn't teach and weren't cloistered because I just didn't feel attracted to either of those. I felt more more attracted to the cloister, but I just I don't know. It wasn't quite there. So I found out we had sisters who 
do what we do, which is combine the active and the contemplative life in a way that is fairly unique. Um, so our apostolate is in-house. We don't go out to serve the sick poor. We bring them into our home. And that's been how it is from the very beginning. Our foundress is Nathaniel Hawthorne's youngest daughter, which is also very intriguing to me. Cool. Um, she was also a convert. Um, and she just decided to take a three-month nursing course and bring the cancer's poor into her home because they were the most neglected. People thought cancer was contagious, so they would just kick people out or they would send them to, um, you probably know Roosevelt Island. Yes. It used to be Blackwell's Island, and it was um, the Insane Asylum, the Alms House, the Alms House Hospital, and it was not a good place to end up, right? You only ended up there when you had no other options. Um, mm. So people would just kind of be discarded. And if you had something incurable, I mean, why bother taking care of someone, right? Like, wow. that's expensive. And um, so just really, she just... Um, this really struck her when she heard about a seamstress who had, this had happened to. She'd been sent to Blackwell's Island and just died by herself um, mm. because she had had cancer and there was no one to take care of her. Um, so she began bringing people into, she rented a one-room tenement apartment. She painted it yellow to make it more cheerful. Um, and she started bringing people in. She did this in 1896. And we do the same thing now. And that really caught my attention that we, uh, this community did the exact same thing that their founders did um, in accord with modern standards and in an up-to-date way, but still that's, that's all we do. Um, I also loved how specific the apostolate was. Um, I admired people who, I admired communities that had all these different apostolates, but it also terrified me. <laughs> like, well, yeah, you might join for this, but then you end up doing this. And it's yeah, just, I wasn't yeah. ready for that. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, it's, so I was, I just thought it was beautiful. And I think the thing that was most beautiful to me was that she saw our community as living life at the foot of the cross. Mm. And because St. Mary Magdalene had been such a part of my conversion, I just decided I wanted to be wherever she was and she was always at his feet. And so I was like this, why would you want to be anywhere else? But at the foot of the cross, this makes the most sense. There's the blessed mother is there. St. Mary Magdalene is there. St. John, you know, the, the priest is there. Um, all the graces of the crucifixion, all of the, the safety of his precious blood, um, all of that love that is happening. I just, I didn't want my life to be anywhere else. Um, and she, she saw the community that way as consoling the heart of Christ, which is another amazing thing. I, I remember the first time I heard that we could console Christ. I mean, with all of the things that led to his crucifixion, our sins, but that we could then do things that, that were consolation to the sacred heart of yeah. God. I just, I was like, that's amazing. You have, like, we have to do that. Right. If that's even an option, you can't pass that up. Um, and so that's, you know, and sh you spend your life with the suffering Christ, with mm. the sick poor. Um, the more I read about her and the more I read her writings now, um, the more I just, uh, now it confirms my vocation. <laughs> Back then it was finding somebody who um, loved the Eucharist the way that I had come to love it more than me, obviously. <laughs> Her cause is open, mine is not. <laughs> not yet. Uh, I think we have a long way to go, Cece. <laughs> <laughs> but, and then I had to grow into her love for the poor, because I have to admit, and I think it's also hopefully helpful to people, when I came into the community, my first love was not serving the poor. It was the idea of consoling Christ. It was the idea of living at the foot of the cross. Mm. It was not necessarily the hands-on, um, you know, working with, I wasn't afraid of the nursing because I come from a medical family. Okay. Um, so that didn't bother me. It was a beautiful apostle. I could see that. And being with the dying, I thought it was just such a privilege mm -hmm. um, that I, you know, I was just like, I don't think I can do it, but that's pretty amazing. You know, yes, uh, yes. It felt like standing in the breach, you know, and Mother Alfonso, my founders, she uses a lot of uh, military imagery. And that's, mm. I th you know, she kind of sees herself as, as like soldiers in, in the battle against um, 
despair and, and this person not knowing their dignity. Which is beautiful and I think really important because you could be a nurse anywhere. Yeah, our foundress was Mother Mar Mary Alfonso who had been married. She'd had a child who had died when they were five and mm -hmm. she was separated. She'd been working as a writer and she was very interested in art. And then our co-foundress was a portrait artist. Mm. Neither of them had any nursing experience. That's not required for a vocation in our community. Um, and so it's, I think it's important to bring up because it's, once again, discernment isn't a checklist. It's not comparing your resume against the charism of a community. Yeah. It's, um, visiting people and, and being around the sisters and being around the apostolate. And I loved the apostolate in terms of um, how well done the nursing was, mm. how much the sisters clearly loved it, um, how, um, how Eucharistic it was in that. And you'll notice this in the saints too, right? So the saints who love the poor also love the Eucharist because mm. it's the same Christ. It's not a different Christ that they encounter in those two places. And that's not, that's part of the reason it's like, oh, how do you work and pray? It's like, well, because it's the same Christ. And so you're with him either way. Mm. Um, and that becomes, I think, the more you're around the apostolate and hopefully growing in your prayer life, the more you're seeing that this is the same movement but with different external activities mm. um, mm -hmm. and so they're not your like mother Alfonso said you have to leave prayer to serve but don't desert prayer you know and don't desert service to go pray you don't have to abandon either to do to do the one or the other at a mm. certain time um it's very beautiful and it's yeah it's just um it's so easy to think to look at it and say like okay well how do i fit how do my gifts fit how do i you know am i going to be happy here and i'm not saying those are bad questions but um like my co-founder is her her question was when i find a work of perfect charity i'll join it that's a really high bar and it had nothing to do with <laughs> mm -hmm. with her gifts as a portrait artist with her you know um, even with her desires, she actually didn't like being around sick people. Her father had been a doctor, and uh, our co-foundress would just wait outside while he visited. Um, so it's, it's yeah, I mean, it's just really, um, it's really easy to make it more utilitarian than it is, mm -hmm. and to forget that the Lord's calling you to a whole life and not just to a series of activities or a list yes. of qualities or, you know. Um, yes. And that's why visiting is so important. And I yes. felt so yes. comfortable around my sisters. Mm. Um, I was really nervous around sisters, even as a postulant. I was so nervous around other sisters. Mm. I just didn't, I could like barely get myself together. But um, around my sisters, I felt very comfortable. And that was helpful as yeah. I discerned to say, okay, I feel very comfortable around these sisters. And not that I was never nervous as postulant. You're always nervous as postulant. But, <laughs> but it's, there was something that I felt I could be myself. I just didn't know who that was yet. <laughs> yes. So. I, lo I love what you're saying about it not being a checklist because um, I think a lot of people, I did, I totally did this. I was like, I'm an actress. Like, I cannot be a nun. There's no way. That does not <laughs> use my gifts. And uh, first of all, it's not true that God can't use your gifts because I ended up working for the sisters. Even after I discerned out, I worked for the Carmelite sisters for the age and firm. They mm -hmm. are, they do, uh, you know, nursing homes, palliative care, hospice care, and they found so many ways to use my gifts. And then even mm -hmm. more than that, I just love the work and I love the sisters themselves. And I love the, the residents that they serve. And so mm -hmm. just, it wasn't even about hey, this doesn't use my gifts. It did, first of all. And second of all, even though it used them in many different ways, the deeper part was the heart of it. Um, right. And that's not the same as becoming a nun, obviously. But because I had the opportunity to work so closely with them for five years, I was mm -hmm. just amazed. And even when I was discerning religious life, I was like, you know, it's not really, it's not about this checklist that I have in my mind that I've already decided I can't be happy unless I do X, Y, and Z. Because honestly... Right. Nobody told me when I became a mother 
<laughs> that I was also going to become the family administrator and the bill payer and the family right. scheduler and, you know, the nurse on occasion when my children are sick, when they need it. Yeah. And now mm -hmm. as a special needs mom, I've stepped into a whole other set of expectations as well that I did not mm -hmm. know I was signing up for when I took my wedding vows. I think that right. the thing with religious life, which is both hard, but then also really good is that you have like a formally set charism mm -hmm. and you have a rule of life and you have an apostolate that you already know in advance and you don't know everything, but you, you have an idea. It looks like you're giving up a lot more than when you get married, but you kind of do it all at once. Whereas with marriage, yes. sometimes you're like, oh, I didn't know that this right. is, nobody told me <laughs> that I was going to have to shovel a, you know, hundred foot long driveway. And that's what right. I'm doing today as my vocation, right. you know, as, exactly. As my vocation yeah. demands. Nobody told me this. Um, yeah. and the so, giving up tends to be a little more dramatic it, yeah. initially in yeah. the religious life. And then he works on you in all of the other ways. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. So, you know, and, but it is finding those ways where it's, it's about, once again, it's about that relationship. You're not yes. saying yes to a checklist of things. I mean, you didn't, mm -hmm. even if you had known, you wouldn't have been saying yes mm -hmm. to administrator, nurse, uh, you would have been saying yes to Rafi and Zeli yes. and Nora, and you're saying yes John, to the people. Yeah. So it's not just, and that's how it is with our, our, patients too or guests that we serve is that you're not just doing this nursing care you're taking care of the specific person yes who needs you in this specific way and you know and so it's always personal and it's the same thing with the way the lord loves us right that's why things go the way they go is because mm -hmm. he knows us and loves us personally yeah so it's about taking the time to uh learn to trust him that this is all because he knows and loves you. And that's also part of the waiting, right? Like the mm -hmm. quote that you were, mm -hmm. um, that you said earlier is that he, he knows what we're ready for before we do. And so we tend to want everything all at once, but if he gave us everything all at once, it would mm -hmm. not be good for us. Right. And so right. because he loves us, he makes us wait. Mother Alfonso wanted people to come live with us and to share our life. And so that's really important to us, but it also means we're not quite as visible and that's, that's good. That's part of our life, but it's just mm. really wonderful to share something you love so much with Absolutely. everyone, you know, and um, to let people know that there are places that, um, that care as much as, as they probably do about the sick and the poor and, yes. and are serving them and that we're able to do that for free because God is so good to us and sustains our community and that he'll do that for each individual person in their own way. Like wow. he's, if he's calling you to something, he's not going to leave you on your own. And that's part of the reason we don't like, formally beg or anything like that is because mother said it's his work. And if he wants it to continue, he'll take care of it. And wow. he has. So, you know, I think we can always apply that to ourselves too, in addition to kind of the way we see it in our community. Amazing. So, what would you say to someone who is like, this is such an amazing order. I want to live at the feet of Christ as well, but I could never <laughs> develop a relationship with someone. Again, these are the rules we put in our heads, right? Mm -hmm. I couldn't do this. Who, who would say, I, I could never develop a relationship with someone and get close to them and see them in so much pain and then watch them pass away mm -hmm. and know that, you know, this is not, uh, this is where this relationship is going. How, what yeah. would you say to that person? Um, it's a great question. I've actually had my patients ask me that too. Wow. I had one, but she was very, very blunt. Uh, I, was, I loved her. So she, mm. <laughs> she looked at me and she's like, you know, I'm dying, right? And I said, yeah, I do. She said, well, so why are you bothering to love me? Because you're just going to come to care about me and then you're going to be sad when I'm gone. And she was one of the more forthright people who... <laughs> um, but I think it's a question of um, why do we love people, right? We don't, I'm guessing that most people when they get engaged, they're not like, oh, you're of this age and you're of uh, moderately good health. So our time together will be fairly long. And so it's worth the investment of my heart to be part of your life because just, you know, statistically, you're probably going to live for a pretty long time. And 
like be yeah. pretty healthy during like we don't do that <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's not how you fall in love um and it's also not how you serve right um so we fell in love with christ who already suffered and died and rose again and that's what gives the fundamental hope that we operate on is that we're not loving these people and then just losing them and, and we're bereft and we have it's just another hole in your heart mm. but that they come here for so that they know their dignity and worth and that they are loved even when they aren't who they feel like they should be or want to be or were um and do we show that love imperfectly? Of course, because we're human too, but to be able to show it at all, to be able to genuinely say to somebody who doesn't feel beautiful, like you're, you are beautiful and I do love you. And it's not because you're useful and it's not because you're doing, I mean, they do things for us that they don't recognize. I've learned more from my patients in the last eight years than I probably ever did in most of my college classes. Mm -hmm. Um, because they're they're so honest and it brings out from you sincerity that um, can easily be missed when you're trying to be someone else. You can't be somebody else any more than they can because they don't have much of a choice a lot of the time, right? When you're sick, when you don't feel good, you're pretty much just who you are. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And we owe that to them too because we love them. And to say... It's not about it being comfortable for me. It's about me staying with you. Mm-hmm. And that's what, that's what we're about. Like that we're going to stay with you and we're going to help you. If you don't already know the Lord, we're going to do our best to show you that you're loved so that when you meet him, it's not just meeting a stranger that you don't know, but meeting somebody that you can say, like, I may not have known you my whole life, but you gave me this thing at the end of my life that maybe just opened the door. And if they do know the Lord, then you can share some really beautiful moments with people. I, I'm inspired by people's faith wow. as they get ready to to meet the Lord and, and they, you know, they get sicker. And it's it takes away the temptation of our culture to make everything about uh, how much value you can get out of it. And mm-hmm. do you miss some of your patients? Of course, but that's where our faith comes in. I mean, I don't. I hope to see them again. That's part of why you pray for them. I mean, you're fighting for the soul to say yes to Christ so you can meet them again. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have very hopeful to see a lot of my the people I've care, had the privilege to care for in heaven. I mean, that's where we want them to be, and that's where I want to be. Um, and Christ gives us that hope because he tells us that we serve him in them. He tells us that he's going to keep his promises if we stay, you know, stay with him. Um, he did rise from the dead. So it's not just some shot in the dark that like maybe this will happen. He's told us, you know, and so it's believing his promises so that we can always be with him in them, you know, and then be hopefully be him to them and just let them know it doesn't matter. It's not about the length of time. It's a privilege to be part of your life. Mm. Yes. Wow. (laughs) What an amazing note to end on. I am going to link to your community's website for sure in (laughs) the show notes so that all the women who are like jaws on the floor after that, hearing that can go click and go get in contact with you guys and come schedule a visit. He said, we're happy to talk to people. Like we love sharing what we do. We love our life. So it's, you know, you want to share the things you love. (laughs) Of course. Um, Oh my gosh. And ladies who are listening, um, you definitely want these ladies praying for you. So go (laughs) and meet them. And if you're meant to join them, great. But if you're not, you have got an awesome prayer team. So we do, yes, we I do see, pray. <laughs> see no downside. Also, Jesus is there. So yes, ev- everywhere. Downsides. Yeah, He's, <laughs> the Lord is very good to us here. We we live with Him. It's one of my favorite parts. <laughs> It's amazing. I wish we could talk all day and I hope we do get a chance to have another conversation. Yes, that would be great. Um, yeah. I can't wait to put this episode out there. Um, so thank you so much for being with me today and may God bless you. 
And you too, um, Cece. Thank you for inviting me. I'm so nice. It's so nice to talk to you. <laughs> well, what a great, awesome time to reconnect. Yeah. I just, I yes. feel my heart is so happy from this conversation. <laughs> and I'm praying for you and for everybody listening. You know, it's uh, God knows who everybody is. So it's great. You just pray yeah. for everybody who listens to the episode. It's just let him take care of the details. Just blanket. <laughs> Right. Cover it all. (laughs) Amen. I do too. I pray for everybody who listens as well. So yeah, Yeah. God bless you. (laughs) God bless you, Stacey.